Today we're going to talk about suspension and I'm going to try to focus on kind of building your own race car suspension, a, a kind of DIY fabrication. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about theory, but this is you're trying to make a video that's not too long. And if we get into theory, you know, you can spend years studying this stuff. So with that in mind, I'm going to give you a few terms that you can go look up on your own on Google and you'll get better explanations than I'm going to be able to give in this video. So you should know things like camber, caster, toe. You should also know roll centers, anti-dive and anti-squat or pro-dive and pro-squat. Uh, that's a type of geometry that you should be aware of. Bump steer and weight jacking and something depending on how technical you want to get you should get an understanding of slip angles if you want to get some books race car and vehicle dynamics this is used as a textbook in college courses this is often kind of the the definitive starting point for for things uh, the downside to this is it's there's a lot of math and formulas and it's looking at everything from an engineering standpoint not necessarily the, the a practical standpoint there's, there's like a third of this book is about tire modeling, which uh, is really important to how a race car handles. But unless you have all the data you would need to actually model whatever tire you're going to use, it's not really relevant to what you and I are going to do out of our garages. But there is a lot of good information in here. A more practical engineer's level, uh, this book covers chassis and suspension it probably covers a lot of other things but those are the two things that i i usually come to this book for and uh it does a good job of kind of walking you through the the evolution of race car design from early on it's it's very much the same thing that uh, mike costin did uh, in this book uh the downside to this book is it was written in the 60s so if you're looking for how they thought in the 60s this is perfect if you want to see where we've gone from there, go, go with this book. And this book covers a lot of what's in here. This is also fun because it's right from the horse's mouth um, from somebody who's working at Lotus when he wrote this. So the first thing we're going to look at in the race car chassis book, on page 44, what I, what I talked about in the GT40 video uh, had to do with the, the load path this is for both the front or rear suspension. This here is a, a front suspension shown where your side to side load is going straight across and you've got rod ends here. So that's all nice and adjustable. And then you're, when you're, when the wheel's braking, the wheel wants to go that way. And so it's putting a force in through here and it's got rod ends here. And so that's nice and adjustable. If you can't do that, then you end up with a, a triangle where it doesn't necessarily have to be in the middle, but, but for simplicity's sake, it's in the middle. And what this diagram is showing is how much higher the forces are for, for a 500 pound deceleration force. See, this is putting quite a bit less force here, whereas here it's more than double that. And so the way you can avoid that is to have a wider base here and you see that the numbers have come down quite a bit from here and again if you had to do this you could do it this way you would just need to make sure things were stronger and about twice as strong as you would need for something like this notice also that here the rod ends are in line with with the load so that straight here there isn't really room to do that so they've put the kind of ends you'd see on the inside of a GD40, for example, or a, a lot of cars. And, and this is a nice, simple, strong way. Uh, it's easy to have a, a bearing or a bushing in there. This is great. It just means you only have adjustment out here. From a chassis standpoint, obviously your suspension has to attach to the chassis. Uh, so I wanted to show something, and we'll look first in uh, Costin and Phipps racing and sports car chassis design from the early 60s. And this here is uh, a diagram of the, the tub of the Lotus 25 and 33. And <clears throat> I wanted to use this because it's just a nice, simple thing that you'll, you can apply the basics of this to a lot of different cars, including tube 
construction cars, and including sports cars like Lolos and GT4s and Ferraris from the mid-60s, uh, what you end up with is the side structure, which in these monocoques has um, the fuel tanks in them. And then you've got a bulkhead at the rear. This is where the engine goes. You've got a bulkhead at the front. You've got this firewall bulkhead that's the back of the seat, and you have this bulkhead where the gauges are. It's kind of the dash, and your, and your legs go through there. And here we're going to look at it in a different diagram. Uh, so this is the anatomy and development of the sports prototype racing car by Ian Bamsey, and it just happens to be a book I'm reading at the moment, and it has this diagram that's in these other books. It just has a bigger version of it, which makes it easier to see on camera. This is the same car, the Lotus 25, and you can see these would be the fuel tanks going on the side. But you can see the front bulkhead, where the dash is, where the back of the seat is, and the rear of the car. Engines it here, gearbox sticks out the back. And the reason I, I want to look at this is where your suspension is going to connect, you need it to be well and supported side to side. If we simplify this even further, this diagram is the same idea, it's just dumbed down even further. And, and I'll explain there's a, there's a little bit of complication in using this example. But if I wanted to do it so that my suspension had this, the side-to-side -side loads going straight across here, that's fine because I've got this bulkhead here in the front. Then for the braking forces, this is coming back. And if this can meet this bulkhead here, well, then, I mean, you already had that there for holding the steering wheel and the gauges and all that, and, and strengthening, you know, stiffening the, the connection between these two sides. This becomes a great place, a natural place, to mount your, your rear suspension attaching point. Then in the rear, same thing. You've got the side-to-side -side load arm coming straight off the back, and then the acceleration and deceleration forces are carried through this one, which is going to be supported by the, the firewall bulkhead, where the rear roll bar is. Now, unfortunately, in the real world, life isn't this simple. And just to muddy the waters, I'll explain that on the actual Lowe's 25, this bulkhead is further back than I thought. And so this arm doesn't actually come all the way back to it. And how they make that work is the Lowe's 25 and 33 uses uh, a rocker arm on the top of the front suspension. So it mounts right in here. So, so all of that happens right in this front bulkhead. And, but then the lower control arm actually does come back. It just doesn't come back quite as far. But because it's on the bottom, it comes to say here, and there's just a metal structure that goes across here that your legs just go over on their way to the pedals. So it's not in the way of anything, and that allows them to support any loads from here all the way across to the other side. But it's important that wherever it attaches is, is reinforced. And so I just wanted to show this idea that a simple way to look at suspension uh, is just to make sure you've got these reinforced areas for it to attach to, and you've got a place for side-to-side -side loads and accelerating and decelerating loads. Now let's talk about actually fabricating something. Now these are all parts that are easy to get in the US. So if you're outside the US, this might not help you as much, but maybe it'll give you ideas of, of what you can find or just the general way of constructing something like this. Now we'll mention the GT40 because obviously a lot of traffic comes my way because of my GT40 project. That had tubular control arms with non-adjustable pivot points at the chassis, which is a nice, simple, strong way, way to do it, but it's not obviously adjustable. The adjustment was made at the outer end where there was a ball joint that looked a heck of a lot like, like a rod end. It's, it's like this, only bigger with, it's got a permanent um, bolt thing sticking through it that, that is the ball joint. <laughs> From an engineering standpoint, that's basically putting a rod end in bending uh, because it, it's putting side to side forces are going this way, but braking forces would be going against it. But it's, it's so big that it, it can take it fine. I really like that, that ball joint at the end. I wish the GD40 style had rod ends or something else at the other end so it was adjustable at the other end as well. I would still love to get those, those ball joint outer ends, but I think it's $800 for a set to get all four, uh, you know, uh, two uppers in the front and two lowers. 
And that's a lot of money for something that doesn't need to cost that much, especially when there are other options that I would say are actually a better way of doing it that are cheaper to do. This is a Chrysler style ball joint and a lot of aftermarket places make this. There are a couple different styles and so I'm, I'm not going to give, it's like K772 or 727 or 722. There, there's, there's multiple styles. One of them, uh, even though it's a Chrysler and it, this has the same specs and dimensions as a Mustang 2 one, which means you can use a Mustang 2 style uh, spindle which you can get lots of different versions of that. And there are other aftermarket spindles you can get that'll have the same size, either because they're basing on the Mustang II or they know these are available. And again, there's different styles of these with different specs. Um, so there are different spindles if, if you're looking at, at Corvette or Camaro style. Anyways, you got lots of options on these. So they sell these rings. And what's, what's nice about these is they just screw in. I'm not gonna waste your time screwing this all the way in. But so that screws into there. So what you could do, you're making your suspension is, you know, cut, cut this so it's uh, uh, mates up there, but you weld on there, uh, ignore this bent end, um, this is just some scrap. Uh, so, so you weld on there and you'd weld another on here and you've got a triangular shape, uh, one tube being the side to side load and uh, the other tube being the, the braking forces, we're talking front suspension. Uh, and then you can get different versions of these ball joints with different lengths here, which means you can change your roll center just by, by changing these and, and do some pretty cool tuning that way. This is $10. Uh, these are good aftermarket ones, or I think 50, but you can get cheaper ones for 25 if you're, I think 25 or 30. So, so that's, that's one way to do it. And, and at the, here, let's pretend it's this. Uh, you can put rod ends at the end, and that means you can change, uh, if you've got one here and one here, that means you can adjust the lengths of these rod ends and, and be moving this forward or back or out or in, and that means you can set your camber or your caster that way. And this is how I made the suspension in my GT40. But in order to adjust this, you have to unbolt this from the chassis. You have to turn it at least a half turn in or out, or that all of your turns have to be at half turn intervals. And you just, you turn it in or out and then you bolt it back in. And that doesn't seem so bad, but when you make an adjustment and then you have to measure everything and check and then they're like, oh, that's not quite right. I need to go uh, another half turn. Oh wait, well, no, now it's messed up the caster because everything affects everything. So now I've got to do an adjustment here. And now you end up having to go through several versions of unbolting everything, making a change, bolting it back together, checking, unbolting everything, making a change, bolting it back together, checking. That gets old. So another idea that I'm gonna throw out there is this. Now, obviously it's the exact same thing as this, but it comes with these two things welded onto it. And this is for, uh, it's just as dirt racer, actually. I'm not entirely sure the exact car this comes off of. Uh, but I got this from Speedway Motors. What you do here is you get a clevis and you put this on and you put a bolt in there and that means, screw this on. So now you've got this suspension set up where this is gonna be your side to side load and this is gonna be your braking load. And that means, now obviously you'd have jam nuts on these so they can't turn when you don't want them to. But that means that whenever you make an adjustment, you just loosen the jam nuts and you turn this like a tie rod, uh, making it longer or shorter, and you can make as fine an adjustment as you want. And that means you can make adjustments so quickly. So it's, it's really something worth looking at. Obviously you can buy threaded tubular ends like this, um, or you can make them by, you just buy some stock, this is chromoly, and you get a threaded insert that's the right size for the tubing. It goes in, you put a bead of weld around there, you now have a, a threaded tube, and you do want the other side. Another thing you can do, now, now this is great because these attachments are going straight to the ball joint and they're lined up so that they're, they're going into the middle where the ball joint is. If you don't have this, something I've seen on a number of cars, including cars I've owned, including cars I've made, is 
you've got a tube like this and you put, you weld the bracket on like that, so you end up with, let's see if this is the right size. So say your wheel attaches here, and you wouldn't have that out that far, uh, but then you can have, uh, well, you'd want this as close to the end as possible. You, you'd have something like that to create your suspension. And this, again, puts this in bending, so it's not great, but you'd have a nice beefy one there. But then the downside of this is every time you want to adjust camber, you have to unbolt this, and you have to turn it exactly a, a full turn before that lines up again. And that's, that's not the worst thing in the world, um, but obviously that's not as good as a setup like this. So all the things we just looked at are really for an upper control arm in the front suspension. You can apply the same idea to the lower control arms and also to the control arms in the rear, uh, but things get a little more complicated because you're usually gonna need a perch for a spring or a coilover. Uh, and you can do that in a similar way to, to what I showed where you, you just take some tabs or you can get brackets that are designed to curve over the tube and you weld those in and well, close to the end as possible usually. Um, and and this will be a mount for, for your spring perch. And you can do the same thing for sway bar mounts as well. You can make something better, uh, stronger, but, but lighter if you weld a structure you know, in between your, your two diagonal arms. You can put it in here and that, that can allow you to, to recess it so it's, it gives you more length for, for your coilover or it can come up. But again, if you do that, you lose some adjustability. So it's, the decision is yours. Do what you think is best. If you want it to be as light and strong as possible but lose some adjustability, you can do that or you can put more adjustability in and just have to use kind of beefier parts which will make it a little heavier. It's just however you want to deal with the compromise. The other thing you could do, if you want to get more sophisticated, uh, <clears throat> and it would work with a, a suspension like this, is even though this isn't a lot of room, you could make a mounting right here for a push rod. And instead of having, if this was a lower control arm, instead of having a coilover going here, you just have a push arm going up to a, to a rocker and then have your coilover in the chassis. There are many advantages to doing the, the push rod. Uh, there's also the pull rod version of that, which gets that weight down lower. That gets pretty tricky to implement, so I'll leave that up to you to research. But I hope that's been helpful and gives you some ideas and at least gives you a jumping off point of things that you can go research on the internet and learn much more about. Thanks for watching.